Jordan, new members, and he is really one of the pioneers in scoliosis surgery, especially in the pediatric age group. He is uh, from Palestine, and he's a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. He is associate professor of pediatric and spine unit in Najah Medical School in Palestine. He is uh, adjunct faculty in orthopedic department of Medical University of South Carolina. He is adjunct faculty of Biomedical Engineering Department in University of Toledo, Ohio, and he is uh, our privilege to be a member in our Spine Society group. Uh, we would like to welcome Dr. Uh, Ala Azmi Ahmad uh, to share his experience and his knowledge with us. Humbly, thank you for your being here. Thank you very much. Uh, First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Saad for the kind invitation uh, to give a talk, and I'm honored to, to give a talk to our dear people in Jordan and all over. And I'm uh, also happy and uh, thankful to Dr. John Bennett for giving us uh, this uh, kind invitation to broadcast this uh, lecture in the Neurosurgical TV. Thank you very much. Uh, now, for growth preservation in pediatric scoliosis. First of all, early onset scoliosis is a term that includes all spinal deformities within or below the age of 10 years. And this is actually a definition that has some controversies now because there is something called skeletal age and there are classifications, other classifications that might be included, and not only and uh, it's not it's not only ten years of age above or below. But to make it simple, just look at it at the age of ten below or uh, above. So, and the term is having different etiologies, including idiopathic, neuromuscular, syndromic and congenital. It's a very heterogeneous group. So the early onset scoliosis is not as common as adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. We need to know that early onset scoliosis, by definition, not just below 10 years of age, but it has some more serious problems than adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, except of course, if adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is more than 100 degrees. But generally speaking, for early onset scoliosis, it might have some fatal problems to the child, especially affecting the uh, cardiac and the pulmonary system. Uh, as we said, as it's not common as adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, but it has higher incidence of morbidity and mortality. So treatment is a life-saving measures more than a cosmetic issue. In the past, the problem of doing surgery for early onset scoliosis, there was a title called better, shorter than crook. So the main management was before 20 years or more, it was just fusion. And it, it, it was based that instead of having a crooked spine that will increase with time, you will have a straight spine, though it's shorter, but it has the benefit of correcting the spine. With time, they realized that the fusion of the spine means you have uh, uh, restricted the growth of the uh, rib cage and the growth of the trunk, which will affect the lung on the long run. And this will cause some serious problems. So with increased awareness of the importance of the lung growth, the, in these patients, treatment shifted to the management to spine growth preservation during spine correction, allowing thoracic cavity and lung growth. This is the most important concept in dealing with early onset scoliosis. How to have a mobilized spine with continuous growth of the lung until the finishing of the puberty. So acknowledging the different etiologies and the potential morbidity and mortality, the impact of management on these patients and family become highly important in selecting the type of management for these patients. What is the ideal treatment for early onset scoliosis? It should maintain a corrected, mobile, growing spine with normal trunk and lung growth with minimal complications. 
this is the ideal treatment which hopefully we can have in the future. But it is mainly to have a mobile spine with the growth of the lungs. So most current advanced surgical treatment do not often result in normal function and has frequent complications. Actually, there is no standard of treatment until now surgically, and there are multi issues about that. So these challenges created instead of being interested in just surgical treatment, we are interested more and more also in preventing or delaying the, treat the need of early surgery for these patients. So, as we said, there is increased interest for delaying the surgery now. Instead of rushing to uh, surgery, we might delay with some tactics. The most important one, which is the most well-known, is the casting. As all we know, there is meta classification for early onset scoliosis, especially in infantile idiopathic. For infantile idiopathic scoliosis, we can have rib vertebral angle difference, and we can have the rib phase. Actually, these are prognostic values for uh, infantile idiopathic scoliosis. What's the meaning of infantile idiopathic scoliosis? It means scoliosis in a child without a real uh, uh, clear cause like congenital or syndromic or neuromuscular below three years of age. And this is what Mehta dis uh, uh, discovered, that if you have a rib vertebral angle difference, as we can see here, you can have a line through the longitudinal axis of the rib and a line uh, with the other rib on the other side. And you can see the angle that is uh, in the middle of the vertebra in between, in the apical vertebra. And if the difference between the two angles is more than 20 degrees, this means most probably this scoliosis will increase. And it means management. Also, there is something called rib phase. You see the convex side. And if the vertebra is not overlapping the convex side, in the convex side, the apical vertebra, like this one, so it will not progress. This is called phase one. If it overlaps the apical vertebra on the convex side, that means it's phase two, which means that this scoliosis will increase and need management. So the, this is the 80-20 rule in which 80% of curves having the rib difference angle uh, 20 degrees or more continue to progress while only 20% with less, less than 20 degrees angle will progress. The overlap of the convex rib also, phase one and phase two as we have said. And patients, at, this is a very important thing to talk about. Patients achieving nearly full correction starting at the average age of 1.1 years whereas full correction is rare above 18 months of age. Serial casting for infantile idiopathic scoliosis often result in full correction in young patients below, if they are having scoliosis below uh, 60 degrees. Why I'm talking about that? Unfortunately, for the, the surgeon's community, we are having some, most of us are having some egos and would like to have challenging surgeries. And sometimes we underestimate the casting because it's not surgery. And this is absolutely wrong. When we know that you can change the life of a child of having a full correction, if you do the casting under general anesthesia below one year of age or before it comes more than 60 degrees, and it will not correct completely, and you might need surgery in the future, if you postpone that to some other time, or when the angle increased. And also, if you have this myth that just let the child grow and we'll see after that, this is a catastrophe. You change the future of the child completely having these basic management, simple management issues. Just casting under GA appropriately and listen to the mother. I remember I saw Mehta, she gave a talk and she said the most important thing in her technique is before that discover it by listening carefully to the mother. If the mother tell you that I'm feeling that the child back is not all right, 
check the back appropriately. If you have any uneven areas in the back, just do an X-ray. And then if the child is having infantile idiopathic scoliosis below 60 degrees of age or below one year of age or 13 months of age, you can correct it fully. So this is a very important thing. And the other problem is that I know from my personal experience with very excellent, excellent early onset surgeons or pediatric spine surgeons, that they would shift these cases to less experienced surgeons because it's casting. Actually, this is our job, is if we can have a chance to give full correction of these children, we must do it by the most experienced surgeon because the children deserve to have it like that. So this is also another important aspect in the management. The, Okay, great. You are the problem, Sarah. So we can realize that usually in scoliosis, you have mainly a rotation, a rotation of the vertebra, like this vertebra. You have a rotation, and you have a convex side which you can see the deformed rib and you see that the space for the lung is diminished and you can see the concave side in which the rib is more flattened and this is how we see it so when you do the correction by casting you don't just push the convex side horizontally speaking this is absolutely wrong now the management is to do, if you know the proper technique focuses on rotational component, that the rib here is pushed posteriorly and the thoracic cage now. So you counteract it by pushing the rib anteriorly. And here the rib is pushed anterior and laterally. So you push, push the rib on the concave side posteriorly. You counteract the deformed ribs, which will give more space to the lung and will correct the scoliosis spontaneously. And also we can see always open a window for the abdomen so as to have appropriate uh, casting for the child. This is a very important issue and hopefully we can, if we have a message for our dear doctors, look at the children if they are below one year of age, listen to the mother. If they have scoliosis and it's defined as uh, uh, infantile idiopathic scoliosis, please either do it or refer it to a doctor as soon as possible to do it. And not just put a brace or something like that. Just do casting under GA appropriately, which is changed every two months or three months or four months or six months until uh, it's fixed. So best result will be initiate, initiation of casting at younger age, below 18 months of age, moderate curve, below 60 degrees of age, and an idiopathic diagnosis. Here we are just talking about infantile idiopathic school. We are not talking about congenital or syndromic neuromuscular. Opposite to that, if we delay the surgery, an average of 39 months of delay was achieved, serial casting. So we can see that in uh, the papers. So now we go to the surgical treatment. Surgical treatment for early onset scoliosis have an objective of fulfilling maximum pulmonary function, spine length, minimal hospitalization, minimal complications, and we should acknowledge the family birth. Especially if we talk about early onset scoliosis with the traditional management that is the most widely spreaded with traditional growing rods that you need to get the child every six months to do distraction of the rods. Just imagine if you begin with a child four years of age until she or he would be 12 or 13 years of age, that means 16 times to go to the OR and doing uh, distraction if there are no other complications, besides of course other complications. So the use, use of growth sparing instrumentation is indicated in patients who have progressive spinal deformity that cannot be controlled or cannot be delayed by non-operative means, such as bracing, 
or casting on or where there's significant and there's significant spinal uh, growth remaining. We must know that this is not a case for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis that have no growth to uh, maintain after that. It's for a growing spine. So technological advances improve the growth friendly spinal implants. We have a lot of implants, a lot of in the industry, a lot of techniques that have been used and spread well all over the world for the last 20 years. So these implants are aiming to correct the abnormal kill while maintaining the growth of the spine and the thorax. So it's a non-fusion technique. We call it a non-fusion technique that permits the spine to grow and also give a space to the uh, thorax and the lung. So the safety and efficacy of the growth-friendly techniques in the treatment of early onset scoliosis, in addition to improvement of quality of life, was documented in the literature. We can see a lot of talks about that. So what are the techniques? Uh, in summary, we can see there is a compression-based system technique like vertebra staples. We can see here, so you compress the apical part by staples. Usually, usually it's done anteriorly. So it will maintain some correction by growing the concave side more and it will correct spontaneously. Distraction base, which is the mostly used one. And we can see here, this is the vector, which was, uh, 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 which was done more than 20 years. Actually, in the beginning of the 90s, it began to spread. And also, this is a traditional growing rod. The vector is mainly through putting an anchor in the rib and an anchor distally either in the rib or in the spine, and you distract <laughs> this anchor every six months so as to correct the spine without having a fusion. This is the traditional growing rod. You have anchors proximally, either with screws or hybrid with books, anchors distally, and you connect them and you distract this area every six months. And there is the magic, which had the FDA approval uh, two or three years ago. And it has a main advantage that you don't need to get the child every six months with the surgeon. You do the surgeon and you get the distraction every two months in the outpatient clinic by having uh, some magnetic thing that will distract the rod inside and it will continue the growth. This is the distraction system. And also this is the guided growth system. Guided growth system, mainly the Sheila, it has a main concept that instead of the distraction that you have just anchors proximally, as you can see, and distally, or like the vector, or like the magic. So you have anchors proximal and distally, and you distract between them so as to correct the curve gradually. And the Sheila, the main concept is controlling the apex of the curve. Here we can see it's not distraction proximally uh, by connecting the proximal and distal bar. You correct the apex of the curve. You control the apex by fusion at three levels, putting six screws. And then you have anchors proximally and anchors distally with the rod sliding in between the screws, the Sheila screws, that will give the space for the Sheila screws to slide so you will have continuous growth of the spine without getting the child every six months to come and do surgery this is the main issue of the sheila which was uh, firstly published by mccarthy and he began it in 2004 and he had the fda approval also two years ago or three years ago but <laughs> None of these techniques have shown real superiority. Every technique has its complications, and the rate of complications remain high. What are, in general, without going to the details of the problems of the techniques, what are the, pre of the demands of beginning this service for early onset scoliosis? You need to have preoperative demand 
like appropriate medical history, team assessment, pulmonary function, MRI, and with or without a CT of the spine. Why is that? In early onset scoliosis, hopefully we are not treating it as adolescent idiopathic. In early onset scoliosis, you have a heterogeneity. Usually you have neuromuscular or syndromic or some sort of a disorder that is related. You need to diagnose it. So appropriate medical history is something very important. Just imagine you're having a child with mucolous polysaccharidosis and you didn't uh, diagnose the child with mucolous polysaccharidosis and you didn't know that he, he or she might have uh, some sort of instability in the upper cervical spine and you might have a catastrophe. 25% to 30% of the children of early onset, early onset scoliosis are having associated cardiac deformity, renal deformity, pulmonary deformity. Many of the patients are having some sort of uh, spinal cord deformity, congenital spinal cord deformity, which should be detected by MRI. You must do MRI for each patient preoperatively. It's a demanding issue before doing scoliosis because if you do a scoliosis with a tethered cord that you don't know about, or uh, the patient is having dystematomyelia and you don't know about, it will end with crisis. So these measures can be done so simply. It can be, can be affordable in many hospitals. And the pulmonary function assessment is very important for two things. For the, the if the child can, can, can go through the surgery, if the child is having a pulmonary function assessment with very low pulmonary function, you need to reorganize your plan and whether the child can be under general anesthesia for some hours or not. And also it's of prognostic value. In the future, if you have appropriate pulmonary assessment, you can know what did you have done in the surgery and in the follow-up. So for the operative demands, you need a spinal table. You need a neuromonitor. Don't ever do an early onset scoliosis without having a neuromonitor. Neuromonitor is one of the best safety measures in your surgery beside your skill, of course. And cell saver, it is, a, a, yani it is better. But now with uh, 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 the chlorhexidine and uh, these issues and the techniques that the surgeons are doing to decrease the bleeding, it's not mandatory. Two spinal surgeons is always better than one spinal surgeon. Better in surgery, decreasing the time of surgery, decreasing the bleeding. Two brains are better than one brain. And of course, trained personnel. I mean trained personnel, the team. It's not just a, a surgeon. You need to have a trained personnel as a nurse. You have, treat, uh, have trained personnel as anesthetist. And you have a trained personnel <clears throat> as a team with a neuromonitor technician. Post-operative demand. You need to have a good filing system. This is crucial. In early onset scoliosis, it's not like adolescent. You don't do the surgery and get the patient home and that's it. You must evaluate the patient either by doing distractions, it's traditional, still it's widespread, it's still it is a real management that you do. <clears throat> so you need to have a good filing system and you need to see this child about the complicate, whether he or she is having, uh, is having complicated whether there is a growth of the spine or not, whether there is a, a crankshaft phenomena, which is the nightmare for any surgeon who deals with scoliosis. You need to assess that. Good nursing care, intensive care unit, it's crucial. Every child, when we have any child in Palestine who are doing early onset scoliosis, even adolescent idiopathic, it's mandatory to put him in the first night in the intensive care unit to have good monitoring of this child. Infection control is crucial. Why we talk about infection control in early onset scoliosis. Usually when you deal with this heterogeneous group, you deal with a real bulk of patients who are immunosuppressed, who are having some problems, who are uh, having some potential for infection. So you need to assess that and you need to have appropriate protocol for infection control, either operative or post-operative. So, Factors including age, curve severity, curve type, growth remaining, child general health, and the ability to tolerate multiple surgeries. 
must be considered in relationship to the benefit continue of uh, the growth of the spine. So as we can see, it's not just a spine, a crooked spine that you need to correct. It's a, a human being that you need to assess appropriately, having potential uh, uh, rate, high rate of complications, need to be monitored, and his or her family are having a real burden of this continuous management. So you need to look at that. And you need to assess the child and do your plan accordingly. And I'll give you some examples about that. Here, for example, <clears throat> this is a technique that was established by Dr. Lutfi. Uh, he's uh, um, in France, he's originally Tunisian. And he said that instead of going looking at the spine, <coughs> you just put anchors proximal and anchors distal and going subcutaneously or subfacially or submuscularly. And he said that the most important thing is to decrease the number of metals and to decrease the burden of surgery. This might be understood as decreasing the burden on the child. But you have a lot of controversies about that. But this is how people think how to decrease the burden, and how to control, in the same time, the curve, without increasing the curve. You don't need, it's not like adults and idiopathic, you need to see the curve nearly straightened or 10 or 20 degrees. Just if you keep it without increasing, it's an issue which uh, might be understandable and might be reasonable. Now look at this case. This is a child who's having severe kyphoscoliosis, as we can see. Here, T5 to T12, as we can see, it's 80 degrees in the sagittal plan, which is a severe kyphosis. And this child was four years of age, by the way. And this is a scoliosis, which has three curves. The main curve is around 90 degrees. Upper curve is 40 degrees. And the lower curve is 43 degrees. And look, when we look at the CT scan, it's very hard to realize anything that you can put anchors proximal. It's very dangerous. And this child is four years of age. <coughs> and with <coughs> the kyphosis that you have here, even if you put two levels of screws or three levels with a four years old child that is having most probably osteoporotic bone, and very small pedicle, if there is a pedicle, it might dislodge. And if you put it below that, it, you will have proximal junctional kyphosis. So would you leave this child? Would you put just a cast with this progressive kyphoscoliotic curve? So what did I do? I did put three hooks in a clawing fashion two hooks going downward on the ribs. You don't touch the spine. So it's still an unfusion technique proximally. And you put screws distally and you connect them. And then you do traditional growing with this. They, actually, this case, I did it uh, more than six years ago. And so this is a safe way to put anchors proximally in a very dangerous spine, in a very small child, in osteoporotic bone, without having the fear of going in the spinal cord of having or having a dislodgement. And as we can see from the sagittal view, that this is a clawing fashion, that two hooks going downward and one hook going upward, which will give strength actually to your anchors proximally. And you can do the cantilever effect of correcting the kyphosis. And if we can see here how it corrected that the, uh, on the sagittal view, it became 35 degrees. On the coronal view, the main curve from 90, it became 60 degrees. So when you do a surgery, it's not necessary that we must say that we'll put screws proximal. In this child, it might be of benefit. The main important thing is safety for these children and having minimal surgeries, as we said, with minimal complication. Actually, this child, 
until now she's having very nice correction of her spine with distraction that I have done, but I changed it before two years uh, to uh, uh, posterior tethering How technique that I've taught. All right. Usually, <laughs> this is a good question. Actually. Usually, when I do the first surgery, I realize that if you put dominoes, it will decrease your correction. And what that was published in the literature by Charles Johnston. So I do put the full rod, and I talked to Campbell about that, and he approved that, and he told me he do the same way. And I preserve two centimeters distally. And I distract these screws for two times, one centimeter each time, until it goes all the way down here. Then I cut the rod, and I put a rod with dominoes to connect them to distract more. This is what I do. So distraction is not done by dominoes in the first surgery, so as to have the maximum correction. And in the literature, they, they said that the maximum correction is in the first surgery, and you'll maintain it in the future. But if we put dominoes in the beginning, especially with the kyphosis, you'll not have very good correction, but you distract the screws distally, and then you, after, after two times, you just put a cut the rods here and put a longer rod distally and connect it with the proximal one and then you distract from the dominoes. Well, it would be one year after the surgery. So you maintain the, the, the correction primarily. Of course, you cannot say that it will not go back or something, but it is a way that you can as much as possible uh, uh, maintain the correction in these uh, kids. So, we have here the spinal growth tethering around the apical vertebra, which lead to asymmetric growth, asymmetric growth as a mechanism of spine deformity correction in kyphosis and scoliosis. This, actually, this technique, I began this technique in 2011 or 12, so it's before at least seven years, and I began it with kyphosis. The main concept of this mechanism is that instead of, the main concept is like the Sheila, controlling the apex of the curve. So you control the apex of the curve, but in the Sheila, you put six screws. Sometimes you do osteotomy to correct it, and you do a fusion technique in three levels, besides putting screws above and below in two levels above and below. McCarthy published in 2017 a paper about five years follow-up for his patients that did uh, the Sheila technique. He realized that 62% of his patients had a crankshaft after the surgery in the follow-up. How can we explain that? If you do a fusion posteriorly, you stop the height of the curve, but you didn't stop the growth, especially anteriorly, which will might give an increased potential for a crankshaft. Because what is the crankshaft phenomenon? It is having anterior growth anteriorly much rapidly than the posterior. So it's like a, a crankshaft that will happen on the apex of the curve. And with the best hands that have done this, 62% are having crankshaft. So what did I do? Instead of that, I tried to maintain, to control the apex of the curve through modulation and continuous growth. How's that? You check the child, and we can see here one of the examples that I have done. <clears throat> she had 73 degrees, the main cob angle. So I check which is the most wedged vertebra. So it's the peaked vertebra here. So I put a screw on the convex side above and screw on the convex side of the vertebra below. But I don't touch the most wedged vertebra here. And I compress it. So instead of putting six screws, you are putting two screws. <coughs> instead of putting screws on the concave side, which is really dangerous, and anybody who works in early onset school know how dangerous is that. 
in these patients. You put in the safest area, which is the convex side. And most importantly, you control the curve through the modulation because we realized with metric studies that this wedging will improve with time because you decreased you decreased the growth uh, the growth of the convex side and increased on the convex on the concave side because you didn't tether it and this wedging will improve and it will maintain some correction and you didn't stop the growth so still you'll decrease the chance of the crankshaft phenomenon so this is what exactly I did. You can see here the dominoes, and you can see here the rod, which will be sliding through this domino because the opening here is 5.5, and the rod here is 4.5, so it will slide. And here is the same thing. This is the distal part. This is the proximal part. And we can realize here that I did put hooks. So I didn't touch the spine proximal, extra periosteal dissection, putting hooks on the ribs. Here, I, see, I saw which is the most wedged vertebra or two vertebras in this example. Put one screw above, one screw below, and put anchors distally and connect them with the sliding of the rod here and sliding of the rod here that you don't need to go through uh, uh, through distraction every six months, because as there will be growth of the child, hypothetically speaking, this will slide and it will give a growth at least of four centimeters, that means four years of growth, without going before. And also, with these rods, you can have a cantilever effect if you are having kyphosis, and you can adjust the rod, especially with severe curves, which I had any a question from Dr. Firas about that with these rods, you can adjust it as much as you can. It, it's not like the magic, which is a big rod that you cannot adjust it and you cannot correct it. Also, there is a very important thing in this issue is that you can use just any laminar hooks, any rods, any screws, and you don't need to be attached to one company. And this is a privilege for our countries or countries with limited resources that they can manage without having huge expenses on putting uh, these implants and it can go for that. Now, I published three papers, as you can see here. Uh, this paper was done, uh, was published in the official journal of the uh, Japanese Spine Society and the other paper about and this paper actually in the Japanese Spine Society, Spine Surgeon and Related Research, well, I had two groups. One group that I did with 26 patients with traditional growing drug with a more than two years follow-up and 20 cases with apical screws, apical tethering uh, that had more than two years follow-up. And we did have results, which I'll show you after. And also, uh, 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 a study that was published in uh, the Global Spine, in the European Spine Journal. It was about kyphosis and posterior tethering. And the other paper was in the Global Spine Journal, active apex correction with guided growth technique for controlling spine deformity in growing child, a modified Sheila technique. We called it the APC technique, active apical control. So we call it now officially the APC technique. So this is what we have seen, and we had the comparison between, as you can see, the APC here, and we can see the traditional growing rods that you have the children every six months coming to surgery. And we can see here nearly the same age, and we don't see actually any p-value uh, difference except in the follow-up time. Of course, in the traditional growing rods, there is more follow-up time because it was the, the thing that was used earlier for, I, I think, most of the surgeons. But still, we have a follow-up of 32 months here in the APC. And we can realize here for the follow-up of correcting the Cobb angle of the apical vertebral translation, which is very important clue for uh, uh, crankshaft, kyphosis, 
sagittal balance, spine length, there is no difference at all. Only the coronal balance, it has some difference. And I think it was worse with the growing rods because of the follow-up and because in the beginning you had uh, uh, the coronal balance was much better in the APC than the traditional growing rod. But it's nearly the same values after uh, the follow-up time, which is more than 30 months, which give me a clue that the APC might work. And you don't need to have the child every six months to come and do the surgery. So there's no, no any parameters about the static and the of rotation? Well, this is actually the thing that we depended on is the AVT, apical vertebral translation. No, and you can see, you can see there is no difference. Yes, no, we didn't check the rotation. We didn't have the rotation. But you have the uh, added added deformity, and you have the ABT, which we looked at. And the biomechanical complications, as we can see in the APC and the traditional growing rod, you can see that the complications are less. But I think because also the follow-up time is less, and also. Uh, 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 because it, it was a little bit uh, easier than the traditional, maybe we had some cases because as we can see in the previous one, that the coronal balance was worse as we see here in the, in the beginning, in the preoperative for the growing, traditional growing rods than the APC ones. And we did a study through the uh, Toledo University in the biomechanical engineering department. And we had great results with a virtual computational study of the spine, depending on the data that I had with my uh, uh, cases, with the x-rays. And we can realize from this study <clears throat> that the height increased, the cob angle decreased, and the apical vertebral translation increased uh, the baseline model and it decreased the compression model. I'm sorry, it's not increased. It's apical vertebral height, TA. We saw actually the height on the concave and the convex side. And we can realize that the apical vertebral height is, was 11. Uh, and it became, on the convex side, it became 11.7. And we have... Here, uh, uh, actually, it is upside down. The concave side was, uh, the concave, convex side was higher, and it didn't change a lot, but the concave side was lower, of course, the height, and it changed, it's a little bit improved, so we can realize also the difference. The kyphosis improved, and the lordosis improved to some extent. This was just with only six months of follow-up for these patients in the computational study. Another example, if you have early onset scoliosis with severe myelo meningitis like that, and if you open this area, it might not close again. And she's having severe kyphosis. So why can't we just open a small incision proximally to put the proximal anchors? And of course, we put iliac screws distally, and we have a small incision, and we just slide the rods under the pathological spine, a pathological skin, so as to have it corrected to some extent. You don't need to correct it fully. You need to stop the progress of the curve with the minimal complications for these children. And if you realize that the myelomeningeal seal, 50% the, in, the infection percentage uh, for these children, and they are having renal problems, they are having shunts, they are having... So it's just an easy way to do it, safe way to do it. And we can realize here that how much this child corrected. You can see a small incision above, small incisions below. You slide the rod under the skin and you don't touch the pathological spot. So in conclusion, in general, in early onset scoliosis, treatment is challenging due to heterogeneous population. No consensus is established until now in the ideal management. It's important to understand the concepts this is very important. It's not a surgery. It's not how to put the screws. You must know the concepts in treating these children and the region of treatment and their indication. Cornerstone of treating early onset scoliosis is facilitation of optimal conditioning of lung development. This is 
crucial. This is the cornerstone uh, of the management of early infant scoliosis. So as to have the child above 10 years of age who's having a thoracic spine between 18 to 22 centimeters and to have at least 50% of the supposed uh, lung function in the future. Spinal fusion should be postponed as much as possible, at least until alveolar growth and significant <laughs> chest development has been completed. Actually, if you know about the lung growth, the growth of the lung is mainly through alveolar multiplication until the age of eight. After the age of eight, the alveoli will enlarge. So try as much as possible not to fuse the spine before the age of eight because of the lung. There is more awareness, should be more awareness about the holistic approach with consideration of the impact of multiple treatment interventions in early life on overall development. Actually, if something is right for this child, it's not necessarily right for the other child. If something is right for this child in this country or in this situation, it might not be appropriate for the same child in another country or in another environment. We need to look after that. Operative complications might be reduced by delaying the age of the initial implantation of the rod using, always use dual rods, don't use one rod, especially after the paper that was published by Akbani in 2009 about the advantage of dual rod. Now nobody do, uh, or it's very rarely to do a single rod. Submuscular implantation, if it's possible, limiting the number of lengthening procedures, thereby reducing the number of unplanned surgeons. So finally, stick to the principles. It's always in medicine, stick to the principles. Refer to the patient to the appropriate specialist. Don't tell the patient, just put a brace or wait until you grow. Do the surgery within the scars that you have, but stick to the principles. I mean, you cannot say that because I don't know how to put screws in these children, I'll just do posterior fusion in situ, which is now eliminated. In, in, in surgery. You must stick to the principles, but do whatever you do appropriate on appropriate basis within the context that you have in your, uh, in, in your area. Do what is more appropriate related to your experience and try to be updated. Don't hesitate to ask for help. It's a teamwork process. You need to have a good, actually when I go to programs outside the country, to Africa and to Central America, when I talk to the people who want me to give them some programs about pediatric spine, I first ask about the pediatrician, to see the head of the pediatric department. I see the head of the radiology department. I see the head of the intensive care unit department. And I see the anesthetist. These are very important people. Without that, you cannot succeed. And you might have some catastrophic issues in these children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Alam. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Yes, sir. It's about you. Uh, we would like to have his uh, picture over there, the, the techniques here. I think. Uh, the slide yeah. with, with the dominoes inside. Yeah. Oh, well, can we, sure. can we go over to that? Okay, great. Uh, so, do you want to stop the screen sharing? Um, yeah, but we have a question. For okay, I can I can stop the screen sharing if you want. I can do that right there. No, it's all right. It's it's going on. Okay. If you want to, I mean. Okay. Did you want to stop the screen sharing or continue? No, 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 it. no. Keep it. It's all right. Keep it on. Okay, I'm sorry. Sorry. I took it off. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, I have a question over that. Okay. So. I mean, for this, uh, where was your point? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, what's the difference? And it was for me, I mean, I am talking about myself. Mm -hmm. It's a great technique and it's a good idea, but I mean, it was easier. What's the difference if you use this or you use uh, the vertical? vertical. vertical yeah. yeah, this is the same method. You anchor ribs here, you anchor vertebra here, and you just omit the distraction devices. Okay, uh, well, uh, first of all, these are the same group. This is a traditional distraction. Uh, growing rod with distraction and the vector is distraction. Yeah. But from my experience and also in the literature, uh, Dr. Carlin, which is who is a very well experienced guy in uh, vector in Boston Children's, he published a paper about the kyphosis, and he realized that a vector with a kyphosis more than 40 degrees is bad if it will not work and it will dislodge. This is one thing. The other thing for a four years old child. If you put the rod, this is a 4.5 rod. In the vector, it's 7.3 thickness, which might be annoying and might be just under the skin and might be bulging, especially in young children. Other thing is that in these, you can have the cantilever effect by adjusting. By just, when you begin putting the rods on the anchors proximally, you can do the cantilever effect to control the kyphosis. In, in vector, you cannot do that. You don't have a cantilever. Why? Because it's it's huge. It's you cannot. I mean, you cannot in the cantilever effect. You you uh, adjust the rod accordingly, but in the vector you cannot adjust it. It's a very thick one. So this is and also yeah. and also this is a very important thing when dealing with early onset scoliosis. Vector is right. Transition growing rod is right. It's for me by my experience. I prefer to do that. I had experience in that, and I didn't use the vector, but if somebody used the vector and has mm -hmm. great experience with it, he or she might tell you that it works with the vector, which is right. Vector is a well-known uh, we, uh, In the Torah, we are not here trying to say that this is wrong or right. We, we, we agree that it's a great idea. I'm just asking it was easier to use a vector. Yes. I use the vector. It's the same thing. Give me the same tools. But And then you need more an additional surgery that you will do at the dominant and the mid, which is already you have a device there. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah but uh, well, I talk mm -hmm. about uh, because it's having a kyphosis and you cannot do a cantilever <coughs> and the kyphosis above 40 is contraindicated in the vector as yeah, it, yeah, the, it is. No, yeah, actually, yeah, an upper thoracic kyphosis, mm -hmm. it's written by uh, uh, Carlin and written by many uh, uh, doctors, Boston children. Uh, John Emmons also mm -hmm. had a paper about that, that if you are having upper thoracic kyphosis more than 40, it's a contraindication for this. Yeah. Can we move to the other technique, if you would mind? Yes. Here you go. Yeah, here. So my, my, my dear, I appreciate the thinking. It's modified shear, which is mm -hmm. a great idea. Mm -hmm. So you, you let me just tell you what I understand from technique. That you fix here, you fix here, you put some uh, screw here, and you have these, one of them fixed and one of them loose. Yes. So how it will stand the spine? I mean, when you when you do the pine, it's patient so fine, you distract, and this is have no screws, so it, no. it will how when the patient stand, how this is will not go back to its original state mm -hmm. because it's not fixed. Well, uh, this is the thing is yeah. that you are having fixed points, fixed points, proxima in both sides, but you yeah. are right. You no, no, slide. actually, you are right about one thing that I talked to Muhammad today about that. With experience, we, in these severe curves, we don't do that anymore. It might just go back, it might collapse, you're right. So we put some cross link so as to stop it from sinking down. This is true. But this is, with exp okay. actually, this is one of the earliest cases mm -hmm. that I have done. But now- well, I mean, it is logic thinking that you put a scuba so it will not go down. Yes, up, yes, down. you're right, absolutely. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. You discovered me. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, what you would do in case of associated neurosurgical condition? I mean, is that for the male I just send the patient to the neurosurgeon, and we have two options. One option is to do in the same set, the surgery by the neuro detethering the cord or removing the edastema to my area and go after him or her to do our, our job. 
or you just get the patient to go to neurosurgery, and after three months, because of the infection might increase if you do it before three months, until there is healing, then we come back and do the surgery. Excuse me, I have a comment for you. Am I being in the medical section in Georgia? Mm. Uh, we use the growing system, mm. vector system, and uh, recently we use the modified growing uh, system. I think the problem in the heliosis we don't think you uh, <coughs> the can get the rotation. Exactly. Not, You're right. Not the Absolutely. Not the, not, the angle, not the progression of the angle. The problem is how to control the rotation in the apical I think there is no standard to control the spot. Actually, you are absolutely right. Yes. I, I, until now, there is no clear standard. How can you control and how can you diminish the potential of the crankshaft by increasing the transient? We are trying to do something and we are trying now, we are modifying it with something else so as to have a, some sort of a treatment. I've been for two years in Istanbul in the Quran. Uh, modified. Uh, Growing system is the better, I think. In these cases with high vertebral angle difference, more than 80 degrees, I think the modified system, but we use a physical system uh, in the apical area, distal, unfortunately, we do diffusion and we control the rotation in the apical area. My question to you is uh, do you, for any case, have a traction for severe cases? No. Well, we don't use halotraction, though halotraction is very nice, but we don't use halotraction because of two reasons. In my country, first of all, people don't accept to have their child having eight needles in his or her skull and going back home. They refuse to do that, absolutely. I, I need for this is, months. No, no, uh, this is, this is ma, 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 yani, to take him home. Yes. And the other thing is that you cannot put him in hospital because our financial system, health systems that the government, the Minister of Health, will pay a package deal, whether the child will stay for one day or will stay for one month. And the hospital, of course, wouldn't accept to have the child for two months because it's a crisis, financial crisis. Because of that, I didn't use that. But it's a very nice procedure for very severe cases. Sir, I have one more comment question. Please. You said that you do MRI for all idiopathic scoliosis. This was the comment from you, or it is just for the things that you think they are syndromatic? First, when we had the MRI, we had a lack of centers for MRI. Mm. We usually have done it to boys. Or, um, to, no, for early onset, you do for every patient. For adults and idiopathic, so we used to do it for boys, mm -hmm. left-sided thoracic curve, mm -hmm. not right-sided thoracic curve, any neurological problem like cavus, for example, or mm -hmm. something like that, or any history of some neurological problem. But now, with the spread of the MRI, <coughs> the cost is not so much. I use it for every patient, for every patient. Better to be safe than to say within 1,000 cases that I'm sorry. About the ICU comment, do you think this is a recommendation especially for our people in Palestine, or you will generalize this for everybody that early onset scoliosis should go? I, I actually... If it I, is, for I, example, I, just to grow and grow, then you put anchors above and below and you slide the road. Do you think the patient can go to the regular Well, floor? from the experience in my country, and I think we can share it <coughs> with many health centers here not all health centers, that uh, when you do the surgery, there will be a fluctuation of the blood pressure for each in the first 24 hours. There will be a, some sort of dynamic disturbance because, you know, a bloody surgery and something like that. And I don't rely on the nursing care in the world in the first day. You might have hypotension without anybody realizing it. Better to put it 24 hours in the intensive care Whatever will happen will be realized and will be checked and will be treated. And I know from a friend in Southern America, he told me about the problem and the child died in the world and nobody knew about it. This is my advice.
what a skull based surgeon is doing here in this uh, oh. skull user structure. <laughs> I learned a lot. And this is the message for the young generation. I go and, it's, and attend the cardiac lecture because I learned from the person. I would like to ask to thank our speaker, I'd like to thank the Judean chapter of the Air Spine. I'd like to thank John Bennett for, for accepting to host this uh, thing. And I ask you all if you have something of high caliber to show the world what Jordan, Palestine, and the Arab world can do, please contact John Bennett. He would be of help, but all a good, high class information. And one last thing. You published the three papers on the same topic. On the same topic. Yeah. Isn't that a message for you? It's not enough just to work and do scrolls and do desks and so on. Publish your work and let the other people know about it, especially if it is a high school. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just want to comment one thing about the publishing of the papers. Actually, it's not anything genius. Just do appropriate follow-up and have appropriate follow-up data. Then you'll have a data to publish. Even if you do the best without having appropriate prospective data, you'll not having a, you'll not have anything to publish. Just keep the day. And it's very important for you to know what you are doing and exactly what the doctor said here in their questions, whether that will work or not. The only way to know whether that will work or not is having appropriate follow-up with an appropriate data. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. So, so, so. Dr. Asni, can I say a word? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, I'd like to thank you and I invite you to present any such quality neurosurgery education to the world anywhere you go. Uh, and we do have a question from uh, Cameroon if you'd like to answer it. Uh, this is a, he's a medical student. Uh, he, he asked that the, the scoliosis treatment, let me ask, which technique of management of scoliosis in general uh, will you advise for low resource limited centers or do you refer them to, to uh, better centers? You refer them to better centers. Okay. You refer them because it's a teamwork. You need to have a good pediatrician, you have good quality x-ray, you have good quality MRI, you have intensive care unit without having <laughs> these things it's some, somehow risky. Actually, we are going to Tanzania next month to do, uh, 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 to improve, to, well, to train some people for scoliosis surgery. And we stopped doing one just simple case of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis because we thought that the intensive care, care unit is not appropriate. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. John. And we, by this, we end our transmission. Thank you, sir. Thank you.